So I found a fairly popular format on my other channel, and why limit myself when I feel I have so much to say about the rest of YouTube? Hey kids, this is FNGR, and we're heading back to Razor Fist via the Neverland Ranch. Dear Razzie, legal fun fact. You now have exactly one job. Either corroborate your claims with substantive evidence, or retract this defamatory dog shit fucking yesterday. And by all means, feel free to fact check this on any number of sites. You cannot defame a dead man for libel or slander. Here, what Willy Washout here has based his entire story on, in fact, he forgot to mention is this. The historical reason for allowing claims for slander and libel is to protect the person's reputation and thus his ability to earn a living and enjoy the benefits of good standing in the community. Once the person is dead, this concern goes away. The whole video is talking about the media and slandering Michael Jackson. That is 100% grade A bullshit. You see, Razzie, this is why a layman isn't allowed to give a legal opinion because you get fuckwits like you trying to offer their righteous indignation as law. Spit out Michael Jackson's dick out of your mouth, take a step back, and unfuck yourself. Yes, I am a layman as well. Yes, I realize I have no business offering a legal opinion. Yes, I encourage everyone to go fucking fact check this, as states and countries widely vary. But once you recognize that the legit issue of Razor Fist video isn't worth a warm bucket of pop piss, this whole video, all 36 minutes of it, is a big, giant emotional appeal. I would have just said this in the comments section, like a rational human being would. But the last time I called him out for being a scumbag about Owen Hart dying and some of his more flavorful remarks, something along the lines of Owen being boring, I guess being a pedophile is okay as long as you act like gold dust, right Razzie? I was told to leave and never come back. Because in Razor Fist Land, if you can do a cute trick and be entertaining, it's A-OK. -okay. Well, if you can't, well, tough tits, Razor Fist here will be the first to fertilize your grave with a steaming pile of his own opinion. Dear Chunky Monkey Games, aka Matt. Hey guys, what's going on? Matt here. Um, I don't usually like to do these rant type videos, mostly because they're just so uninspired, but this is something that really needs to be said, and I think now is probably the best time to say it. Why is now the best time to say it? You mean the time where YouTube is literally a wash in drama, and you saw a crowded market and went, ME TOO! I'm talking about uh, a special kind of cancer on YouTube, and this cancer goes by the name of Verlicify. Um, he didn't really attack Tyranitar 2, but he turned it into an attack, as he always does. Uh, basically he tweeted about, uh, Tyranitar 2 or something, he's like, uh, hey, I don't get your, th I don't get the thumbnail. He didn't, like, tweet at him directly. He's just like, hey, I don't get Tyranitar Tube's thumbnail, you know? I'll put the tweet on the screen. I understand me correcting you will only continue the vicious cycle about absolutely nothing that is internet drama, but for not liking a thumbnail, sir, I'm from the brony community. I thought we had some precious sweet cinnamon rolls. Who the fuck starts internet drama over not liking a thumbnail? thumbnail. Like, more importantly, so what if he didn't like it? Sir, I can't be bothered to find out what content you make, but you must be a one-of-a-kind, extra-special Tumblrina. This is what passes for drama? I envy your gated community lifestyle. Next asshole! Dear Ty Blue. What's up, Drama Alert Nation? I'm your host, Ty Blue, and today we have some abs- Please stop. What the fuck was that? When did Keemstar start hiring the people that Leafy is here picks on to run his channel? This is drama alert. You're easily the most milk toast motherfucker I've ever seen. What do you know about drama? The fridge running out of mayo? Stop for the love of God, your immortal soul in all things in good taste. Stop. I have been working long, sleepless nights to discover this secret, my lovelies. Yes, you did read the title correctly. Dear I hate everything, I understand you're emotionally unstable after your boyfriend Kevin had to go away. It's okay. I understand that you've been through a lot in an extra special edgy phase right now, but what the fuck is this? Like, I get it, you're a goddamn contrarian. I, cool. I don't know if you're trying to emulate Gollum from Lord of the Rings, you're making fun of people with social disorders, or you're trying to make a social commentary on the web's irrational need for drama. Ironically, being a twat and putting out crap still means you're being a twat and putting out garbage. You got a big, beautiful British voice. Why not pick up a novel and start reading it off into the mic if you need to phone it in or something? Hi, I'm Bob. Dear Bob Chipman, this one arguably deserves its own video. Okay, last week we talked about how the X-Men movies aren't very good outside of these two, and this one if you squint and pretend it's 2002. Now, the world deserves various viewpoints, even ludicrous ones, 
So debating what worked here would be richly unfulfilling, so this is more the why. Bob here has to reach down analytically deep to brainwash himself and attempt to lure his fans into this bizarro land that is called the truth of Bob Chipman. This will illustration for how the series has largely failed both as drama in its own right and as an adaptation still remains, in my opinion, the bungling of the Doc Phoenix storyline in X-Men 3 The Last Stand, which manages to not only flub the best X-Men story from the best X-Men creative team during the best X-Men era, but also simply falls apart as a cinematic story in its own right. Bullocks. But no, seriously, the Dark Phoenix story is one of the most super comic booky sci-fi bullshit stories that has ever come through X-Men. I say that as a man who has a healthy respect for not only sci-fi but comic books, this story is briefly touched upon in the animated series back in the day. And when I say briefly, I mean nine goddamn episodes. My math is a little off, but we're looking at three hours plus if we're using the version made for kids. It's a highly complicated story with many of the new characters, including the Mutant Hellfire Club, one of the single most boring, yuppie, uninteresting X-Men villains that I've never met a single fan of X-Men utter out the words, the Mutant Hellfire Club? They're my favorite! With the only long-term contribution being that of Emma Frost, aka the White Queen, who one decade later would join the X-Men, or rather Generation X. You know what? This is exactly my point. Faithful adaptations take a long time. And I would think Bob, of all people, who literally just got done saying how over-fan appreciation for the core content sunk the World of Warcraft movie. And you would think he would come to terms that the Dark Phoenix story just wouldn't fly in a 104 minute movie. Hell, I'm not even going to bother to look up the aliens, the Kree, the Skulls, or any of the other intergalactic players that needed to make this story work. This is the sort of thing, if a decade ago, if the Marvel Disney branch had been working on it, and I mean several movies, this might have been in the realm of possibility. Notice I merely said possible, because the Phoenix Saga and the Dark Phoenix Saga is a clusterfuck of comic books and sci-fi bullshit. Now, I understand that after seeing the Guardians of the Galaxy, it's very tempting to simply say Disney and the powers that would be would just nail it. But that ship has sailed. Not just that, but regardless of who got their hands on the X-Men property at this point, the last thing we need is to have one more person tell the same tired-ass story trapped in a world that fears and despises you. Hollywood has already run the Batman story into the fucking ground. Something oddly enough you predicted. But while I agree with you it would be a mistake to tread back over the Phoenix story one more time, Sadly, if they're going to do it, I do appreciate the fact that they're hitting the fast-forward button. The Doc Phoenix story in the comics goes like this. The X-Men have an adventure in outer space, Jean picks up some kick-ass new powers, they meet some creepy new villains who turn her evil, then she goes even more evil and uses those new powers to turn into a giant bird made of fire and go around blowing up planets, which pisses off the X-Men's various alien allies, there's a big old fight about it, Jean has to die, then a bunch of nonsense about clones and body swapping goes down so she comes back like a hundred more times until nobody cares anymore, but that first stretch, honestly, really good. Like, did you hear any of the crap that came out of your mouth? Clones? Space aliens? I think this is the last thing, and I do mean the very last goddamn thing, that Marvel ever needs to bring to the goddamn big screen is clone anything. It's a messy cop-out device in comics, something any critic of Doctor Doom will point out or even a fan will admit has been run into the ground. When heroes and villains die, there have to be consequences so that the audience can feel something is at stake. It's the same reason why the ending of the first Superman movie is so bullshit. Knowing that the lead protagonist has that in their back pocket not only kills the tension in the movie, but the entire series. It up, and no, I don't mean it's because it's unlikely they'll ever do the outer space stuff. You see, you don't have to do the outer space stuff properly to do Dark Phoenix because that's just aesthetic plot details. You do have to understand the character, what the story means for the character, and the subtext that underpins the whole shebang. And see, till now, Bob, I thought that you had the best intentions. This is going to be some strange-ass Bob Chipman social agenda bullshit. So everyone buck the fuck up. In comics, some of that implicitly means we're really talking about pre-1990s youth culture sexual politics, which means some of it is going to sound a wee bit politically incorrect. Consider yourselves warned. Bob, they're comic books. Politically correct? Have you ever seen the spandex outfits? I can't imagine your friend Anita would like comic books enough to watch your video, Bob. So I think you're off the hook and you can put your balls back down your pants and act like a real nerd just this once. Okay, so the thing about Jean Grey as a comic book character originally is she's boring. In fact, prior to the Phoenix story, she was probably the least interesting female character in the Marvel Universe in that era. On the original X-Men team, she was little more than the girl, and when they added more women to the team, she wasn't even as novel as that. Her mutation didn't offer many tangible drawbacks, i.e. she could pass as normal, she was overall well-adjusted, and she was a quintessential good girl, because being the least interesting woman in Marvel Comics means also being the least sexualized woman in Marvel Comics because 
This is the funny thing. The 20th century Fox retelling of Jean Grey empowers Jean Grey, but not the comic book. Jean Grey in the comic book goes off the deep end because of the Phoenix entity. In the movie, she loses it because of her inherent latent ability that lies within her. Down to the outwardly chaste, respectable, let's hold hands at the country club until after the wedding romance with the equally milquetoast Cyclops. She's Sandy from Greece, she's Annette from Cruel Intentions, she's as pure as the driven snow and exciting as room temperature water. And generally, that's why I ignored her. And you'll notice that wedding comic that Bob shows between Cyclops and Jean Grey? That happened years after the Phoenix Saga in 1994, 14 years after the Phoenix Saga, which happened in 1980. Meaning, according to the canon, Jean Grey was a boring dud beforehand, and she went back to being a boring dud afterwards. And that's not just me saying it. Bob, your own damn video implies it. Phoenix Saga and the whole long build-up into it is thusly all about making her interesting by adding unexpected new layers to her persona in the most appropriately melodramatic way possible. A good girl goes bad storyline. Yes, one with a giant evil bird made of fire, but that's just the outward manifestation. Remember, pre-1990s youth culture sexual politics is the order of the day here, which means we're in a good girls don't, bad girls do territory. So thematically, the crux of this story is that Miss Perfect gradually reveals herself to be a dirty, dirty, dirty girl. Actually, the story most in common with this one would be the exorcist as Jean Grey is possessed, and not in charge of her mental faculties. Which is why when the dust settles, she goes back to being milk toast fucking boring again. Well, once she's alive again. And that's a whole nother convoluted pile of bullshit. Obviously, you can't do the comic book version of this exactly. There's not a lot of room for the X-Men movies to go to space, and the posh mutant eyes wide shut SNM cult probably isn't gonna fly today, granted. But there are surely variations on those details that could explore the same thematic territory and the same kind of character development. And here's the real kick in the teeth, Mr. Chipman. You have no fucking idea how to do this yourself. None. You don't even try and do it because you know the Phoenix Saga is such a broke dick clusterfuck of a hokey comic book bullshit that your big master plan is Disney help is all you can think to say. Bob, I'm sorry you're not getting your Disney X-Men. I'm sorry you trying to explain a 30 year old story isn't going to keep people from watching the next X-Men movie. Jesus Christ, I'm only one year older than this whole saga. Let it go, Bob. For the love of God and taste and possibly even your own sanity, let it go.